I'm Tisha Bader, in for Mark Golub, and in the news, an escalating situation in Israel following new security measures that Israel installed at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem after the deadly attack outside the holy site on July the 14th, in which two Israeli police officers were murdered by three Arab Israeli terrorists. Just a few days later, Israel installed metal detectors at the entrance to the holy site. And while there are those Muslim worshipers that pass through the security measures every day without incident, there have been violent clashes with other Muslim worshipers and Israeli police in the Old City and beyond. And then Friday, a Palestinian terrorist infiltrated a Jewish settlement in the West Bank and murdered three members of the same family. 70-year-old Yosef Solomon, his daughter, 46-year-old Chaya, and son, 36-year-old Elad, were stabbed to death. And last night, an incident in Jordan, which has increased tensions between Israel and Jordan, which were already at a high because of the Temple Mount security measures. An Israeli security guard at the Israeli embassy in Amman was attacked by a Jordanian who stabbed him in the stomach with a screwdriver. The Israeli guard shot the terrorist, and another Jordanian was inadvertently hit by the gunfire as well. Both Jordanians died at the scene. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is said to be in consultations over the crisis. Well, Chaviv Retegur is a senior analyst for the Times of Israel. He joins us now over the phone from Israel to talk about this is escalation in violence and share his perspective on the situation. Thank you so much, Javi, for taking the time to speak with us here on JBS. Thank you for having me. Of course. So it, it really seems like just an implosion of events since the attack outside the Temple Mount, which was 10 days ago on July the 14th. So firstly, what is your overall take on the situation? And then we can talk about the individual attacks and incidents that have taken place since. Um, and the overall take, there's, you know, there's so many directions and to go and so much, so many different players and so much happening all at once. Um, we've seen uh, Turkey try to become a very serious uh, player. Hamas has been talking constantly uh, from Gaza and urging terror attacks. We've seen actual very bloody terror attacks like the one you mentioned in Khalamish, uh, where the three members of the Salomon family were stabbed to death. Uh, we have seen something that I think surprised the Israelis, which is the crisis with Jordan. Um, there was a sense that Jordan was trying to keep things quiet, and now Jordan is actually creating over this, you know, very dramatic incident of a stabbing, and then the Israeli guard, uh, the wounded Israeli guard, shoots and kills two Jordanians, and the Jordanians have 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 demanded to investigate the guard who is protected under diplomatic immunity. In other words, it's, Jordan wants to violate the Vienna Convention. Here, just because of the the incredible domestic pressure the Jordanian government feels it's under, I think if we want to take sort of the overarching look, um, then there are a couple things that are missing, I think, from a lot of the coverage and are very, very key to understanding what's happening. And the first thing is that even though a lot of leaders on a lot in a lot of these different sides and all these different players are being cynical and manipulative. Uh, and, and lying through their teeth um, and, and, and want to instigate, for various reasons and various interests, want to instigate violence and conflict, the people, the Israelis, the Palestinians, the Jews, the Arabs, the Jordanian, um, Jordanian domestic politics, the peoples involved here are not lying. In other words, there's, there's a, a, a very important thing to understand about the Palestinian sense of vulnerability. Um, we have incredible studies of what the Palestinians think about Al-Aqsa. And among Jews, it's very obvious that the Jews of Israel uh, aren't about to dismantle or destroy Al-Aqsa or build a synagogue next to Al-Aqsa or rebuild a third temple. That's not something that has any constituency inside Israel uh, as, a, as, a, as a pragmatic policy, right? Not as some messianic dream. We know this. It's so obvious that it, we can't imagine that the Palestinians really think it. But in fact, we have very good polling for many years that something like 80% of Palestinians are convinced, absolutely and totally convinced, imposed on in Arabic by Arab pollsters and imposed on by American organizations and, 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 and various polling and various ways of phrasing the question, that Israel is trying to take Al-Aqsa from them. In part, it's because they believe that they would do it if the, if the power relationship was reversed, and they can't imagine why Israel wouldn't. And it has a little bit to do with 
how Israel, Judaism plays in Israeli identity is very different from how Islam works in Palestinian identity. None of that is relevant to us today. But what's more important to understand is that 50% of Palestinians, again, over, an, over a, a period of time in multiple polls, something around, give or take 15% about, but something around an average of 50% of Palestinians believe Israel is going to succeed. In other words, this is not a war between Palestinians who are inciting uh, against Israel, you know, while telling lies. There is tremendous amounts of incitement against Israel on the Palestinian side and a great deal of lies being told. But the Palestinian street, ordinary Palestinians, not only do they believe that Israel wants to take away Al-Aqsa, they believe that it is going to succeed in its dream of taking it away. And so you see in Palestinian society, which is very, very tired at this point, there's actually incredibly little actual violence. The, you know, Al-Aqsa is threatened. All of the Palestinian political factions and Hamas and everyone is swinging into action and screaming to high heaven. And you still only see, you know, demonstrations of 600 people, 800 people, 1,000 people. The, the walks, the, the Muslim authorities on, on, on the Temple Mount literally ordered the closure of all mosques in Jerusalem so that no one, you know, uh, last Friday would have anywhere to go and pray except Al-Aqsa, and it still only brought a couple tens of thousands in a city that has 300,000 Palestinian Muslims and, and, and which saw Israeli Arabs, you know, boarding buses to come to Jerusalem, and the whole phenomenon is still very, very small. There's a, an exhaustion with the conflict in the Palestinian street, and it's coupled with this very deep anxiety about Israel and about Israel and about being vulnerable to Israel and not being, you know, really believing Israel and Israel says, oh no, no, we don't, you know, we don't want to take this away. So it's a bigger problem than it looks. In other words, it's, it's not enough uh, for us Israelis uh, and for Jews overseas uh, who see, you know, the Israeli side of things to say absolutely correctly, you know, nobody's touching Alexa, relax. Like, you know, this whole thing is predicated on a lie. It's not enough to say that, because on the other side, there's very little actual dialogue and discussion and trust, for obvious reasons, for, you know, 25 years of peacemaking, which has been essentially, a, a you know, a, a, another, a more uh, violent form of conflict on the ground uh, than, uh, than the many decades of conflict uh, that preceded it between Israelis and Palestinians. But, um, but, but what we're seeing is something that I think is not going to die away very soon. Uh, it reflects authentic anxieties, and it might mean that we're in for a long period of, of, a, of a new long period of low-level terrorism, uh, which uh, should uh, despair us, because um, it will drive the Palestinians further into the ground, uh, their politics will be further warped by it, uh, and it will mean a lot more uh, dead Israelis, a lot more dead Palestinians, and, uh, and nowhere good. We're not going anywhere good good with this. I think it's bigger than it even looks on TV, and I know that on TV and the whole, all, all around the world, in the BBC, they're screaming about how terrible all of this is. I think it's even worse. You know, Chaviv, I'm, I'm, you bring up a really interesting point, and I'm glad you're, you're speaking about this, because... As Americans especially, we're looking at the situation from the outside and we're saying, okay, there was a deadly terror attack outside the Temple Mount. Israel installed heightened security measures. Seems like a very logical, um, necessary step that Israel took to protect not only um, Israelis, but also fellow other Muslim worshipers at the Temple Mount so that weapons aren't brought in again or, or God forbid, explosives aren't brought in to the holy site. It seems like a very simple thing. And then we hear all these calls from Islamic leaders saying this is a violation of the status quo. And, and we're trying to sort of wrap our heads around how is how are security measures a violation of the status quo? Why is there this, which seems like an, an inflation of, you know, this idea of, of Al-Aqsa and that it is at risk, and you're saying that the average everyday Palestinian really has these fears and anxieties that that this could actually happen, and they feel threatened. Right, but I mean, just to clarify, that that's why it resonates in the Palestinian street. That's mm -hmm. why it has roots, and that's why this is probably going to last a long time. The actual Muslim authorities on the Temple Mount are lying through their teeth, and 
um, there was one of the most senior people in the walks uh, was on Channel 2 television, Israel's biggest, most popular you know, television outlet, interviewed there in Hebrew on primetime news. I, I, I think it was on Sunday, but it, it was, you know, one of the last, you know, five days. And um, uh, interviewed in Hebrew two Israelis, and, and, and the Israeli reporter asked him, um, you know, what is this about? This is about metal detectors? I mean, people literally smuggled guns in and hid them at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. If the Al-Aqsa Mosque is so holy, why aren't you concerned about the fact that guns were smuggled and hidden in the mosque? And the guy says to him, just openly, publicly, and this is nationally broadcast on the most popular news program, of, you know, in the Israeli evening, to Israeli Jews, uh, this is not about metal detectors. This is about the fact that God said you should not be here. This is a Muslim place. And, and the fact that Israel would install metal detectors is a sign of sovereignty. It's, you know, that's what a state is. A state is the monopoly on power, the monopoly on violence, the monopoly on law, the, you know, the monopoly on currency. That, that is what a state is. And, and you don't get to be the state that is here. That was the, and that was his statement in very, very blunt terms. So you have at the leadership level, not necessarily in the Palestinian Authority, at least not around Mahmoud Abbas, who really wants this all to quiet down. The King of Jordan certainly wants this all to quiet down. He depends on Israeli money and on Israeli uh, military defense to keep Islamic State off his borders and every other enemy off his borders and Israeli water. Jordan cannot drink water if Israel doesn't provide the water. Uh, the King of Jordan very much wants this to die down. But, uh, but I think that among other leadership factions, uh, certainly the walks on the Temple Mount, um, it, there is a manipulation intended to achieve a political goal. So I'm, I'm not, I don't want them to, you know, get scot free here. But even if they were not manipulating, there would be these anxieties. They run very deep through Palestinian identity, and it's not for most ordinary Palestinians. Based on all the research we have, it's not just about the the, the sort of don't let the Jews get it because it's Muslim kind of a sentiment. It's about the deep sense of vulnerability. Israel to them looks immensely powerful. It could take it if it wants. No part of the Muslim world could really resist. The entire Sunni Arab world around us is, is in free fall. We could take it. We probably will take it just because we could, and that's very widely shared and causes them very deep anxiety. And so it, it runs much deeper, and on top of that anxiety, you have this leadership, which I think, but you know, I'm an Israeli, but I think is driving them headlong into into a wall on this. And you know, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu continues to reassure, to state over and over again, we're not changing any status quo at the Temple Mount. That will remain the same. Um, again, Muslim worshippers have been coming in, are able to pray at the site. They have to just now go through security. And we should mention. Um, by the way, we had one of your colleagues on, Judah Ari Gross, on last Friday to talk about the attack outside the Temple Mount, and he commented, we discussed that, you know, if you want to go to the Western Wall in the Old City, you go through metal detectors, you go through security checks. This is a fact of life that Israelis, tourists, whomever comes to visit the Western Wall goes through security. And anywhere in Israel, you're going to go through security checks. So, again, most people feel like, okay, this is a measure that is protecting me, that is protecting everyone around me from a violent attack. And these same measures are now installed um, at the entrance to the Temple Mount. Right. Can I, let me just say, it's, um, it's even worse from the walk's perspective. Look, you have many holy sites that don't have, you know, at perimeter defenses of any kind. You have some Israeli police stationed near the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the Old City, which is one of the really foundational holy sites of Christianity across many, many, you know, uh, uh, sects and schisms and versions of, of Christianity, Orthodoxy and Catholicism and some other, many, many churches. And the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you just walk in. There's no metal detectors. There's nothing. There are police. Uh, there's a, literally a police station across the plaza. But but there's nothing, um, you know, that, 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 that um, looks for guns on you or anything like that. Now, the, the West, what happens if someone then smuggles a gun in and starts to shoot at people? God forbid, right? What happens? And the answer is that the Christians would turn to the is probably, almost certainly, there's some other incidents in the past that suggested, would almost certainly turn to the Israel police and ask the Israel police to come and protect them, like they know how to do. Now, the, 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 on the Temple Mount, um, 
the, the, the Western Wall, the Jews are very happy about metal detectors because it's, it's Israel protecting the worshippers coming to the Western Wall. It's our people protecting us. And the Christians in the Old City generally trust Israel to protect them. That changes radically when it comes to the Muslim community. When, when it comes to Israel checking for guns to protect the Jews, not to, or, you know, the Israeli cops who were killed were not Jews, they were Druze. But um, Israel is sort of the sense among the worshippers going to Al-Aqsa is that Israel would be, they would be the enemy, and Israel is checking them going in because they're the enemy, not because they're protecting them. What that means, this, this by the way, is openly discussed among the Palestinians. Now, this, this is what's wrong with, with the metal detectors. Among Palestinians who aren't just screaming but having serious debate, this is what's wrong. The trouble is that Israel has turned to the Waqf and has turned to the Jordanians who have oversight of the Waqf and said, great, you know, you can't have guns up there. You can't shoot down at the Kotel or at cops around the old city from up there. So you put in metal detectors. Let's work this out. You do something where you put in some security measures because there's already been a terror attack with dead cops from inside Al-Aqsa Mosque. And they refuse. They don't want to have a their own protective mechanism. They don't trust us, because this is the Jewish state, and therefore the enemy. Uh, the Jordanians won't put in something of their own, which Israel probably, I'm guessing, would accept. Uh, and so they just wanted to continue to be wide open, unprotected. The Muslims are unprotected, and the Israelis all around the site are unprotected. Uh, and so we're at a standoff where they're refusing to do anything, to implement any kind of, of solution. Everything has to go back as though there was never a terror attack. And that's something that for Israelis is just galling. I mean, of there are dead cops. Of course, that's unacceptable. I mean, clearly Israel has to do something, and, and the metal detectors are, you know, just one measure. I know there are also security cameras. There's been some reports in the media now about whether they can have advanced security cameras take the place maybe of the metal detectors. But obviously, Israel has no choice but to put these heightened security measures into place. There is no question. Or have them, or listen, or have them do it. You know, yeah. Israel, Israel trusts Palestinian, now Israel won't let the Palestinian authorities, you know, armed personnel into, into, onto the Temple Mount. That's, that's a question of peace talks and sovereignty and all of that kind of stuff. But Israel trusts every single day Palestinian authority forces. Israel trusts Jordanian forces to police their part of any peace agreement and any border and any boundary, you know, and, and to chase after terrorists. Israel does trust these, you know, different kinds of, of, of groups and organizations. It, it, the Waqf could solve this, but they don't want to solve this. And that's the point that, you know, Waqf officials are telling Israelis point blank. So let's talk about Jordan for a minute and about this uh, attack that happened last night, which you said, as you said, took, took certainly Israel by surprise that this happened. Tell us what you know about the incident and whether you think this appears to be a situation where this person took an opportunity to attack this Israeli security guard or whether you think this was planned in advance. I, I couldn't, um, I, can, I can tell you the sort of, I think what Israelis assume, but we assume from the context of uh, the Palestinian stabbings of the last two years, uh, and this might be exactly that, and it might be something completely different. Um, we do have a security guard with a screwdriver in him, so something clearly happened uh, that was not uh, ordinary, um, and uh, and the fact that he opened fire, there's in the very, very brief initial preliminary um, debriefings that have been done and checks that have been done, um, the Israeli authorities are convinced uh, that this guard acted appropriately, even in this moment where it would be very easy to just dump this on the guard, accuse him of, you know, murder, and try him. You know, for Israel, this is not politically convenient. Um, and yet Israeli authorities seem to believe, and again, this is all, you know, there's, there hasn't been a proper investigation. This is really just the initial debriefing, and we're only hearing sort of responses to the debriefing. We don't have any real facts. It looks like this was a Palestinian Jordanian who decided to participate in the stabbings of the last two years and stabbed an Israeli when he got a chance and the Israeli opened fire the Palestinian, the stabber is killed and the uh, person who was with him is killed uh, and probably by uh, unintentionally but again we don't exactly know um, and that's, that's you know where the facts are at that that's what it looks like to the Israelis um, and the Jordanians kind, you know 
are, are stuck in this place where they have they have dead Jordanians. Uh, it's it's inconvenient for them that this isn't a simple murder by an Israeli because then they could really raise high hell, right? But um, but the Israeli was stabbed somehow. So um, the facts are inconvenient for everybody <laughs> so far. And uh, um, the real the real question is what it shows us about the fragility of the most robust alliance in the Middle East. The Israeli-Jordanian alliance is supposed to be unbreakable because both sides desperately need it. And yet, over these questions of identity and over these questions of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, it, it can fray very fast uh, over a single incident. Yes, and tensions there, of course, were already, as you mentioned, with, with the Waqf, which is a Jordanian entity. Tensions are very high with Jordan. Then this happens. And from what I understand, um, the staff at the Israeli embassy are basically staying put. They're in lockdown, so to speak. Yeah, they're on the, you know, they're on the, in the embassy uh, uh, compound, which is Israeli soil. Um, and the Jordanians won't allow them to go to the airport. Um, and, and that's a violation of diplomacy. I mean, that's a violation of diplomatic immunity. Uh, but, um, but Israel doesn't want Jordan to appear to have given in to Israel because it doesn't want to destabilize the king. It doesn't want to empower the opposition in Jordan that hates Israel and hates the peace treaty with Israel. So Israel's in this position of, you know, um, absolutely declaring its innocence, needing to get this guard back. Israel can't afford to have diplomatic immunity violated because it's inconvenient for Jordanian domestic politics, um, but also not appear to force the Jordanians to do so. It's, you know, welcome to the Middle East. You know, you have to play both sides and you have to win both sides simultaneously. Um, I, you know, it, it is interesting to note that there are, we've had three significant terror attacks in the last 10 days, and they have been strategic. And I, I don't know what that means. I'm going to suggest that a conspiracy theory uh, but um, it looks like there is a, a push, a call, social media, you know, the networks that these people um, uh, communicate with and get orders with and learn how to staff successfully. We know, for example, that the terrorists who, got, who went into Khalamish to murder the Salomon family wore a button-down white shirt. It was Friday night. He looked like a Jew coming home from synagogue on Friday night. Now, he dressed the part so he could get farther in and he wouldn't be suspected and chased after or whatever. Um, so there was some sense of preparation and thought. We have these three Arab Israelis on the Temple Mount who had a fourth uh, accomplice and smuggled firearms into the Temple Mount. By the way, two, two of the rifles, I believe, were uh, Gustav rifles, which are uh, workshop made in the, in the West Bank. They're not... Um, um, you know, they, they took some expertise and planning and thought and, and preparation and, and at least some help from someone on the Temple Mountain at Al-Aqsa uh, to leave just bags lying around with guns in them. Um, and now we have this thing in Jordan where it's a carpenter who walks into the home next to the embassy of the, of the staff or of the, uh, the security guard and of some other people uh, to do carpentry work. And then apparently, we still don't have all the facts on that one, uh, apparently, then turns around and tries to, you know, kill the Israeli. So these are these are prepared. These are thought through. These are planned. And when you look at the Temple Mount and you look at at, at, at at sparking a crisis with Jordan, knowing that Jordan has this pressure, knowing that the Israeli-Jordanian alliance is fundamental, and of course Jordan is the overseer of the Temple Mount, um, knowing that the Temple Mount is a powder keg, you can't murder Israelis on the Temple Mount and not have Israel respond significantly. Knowing all of this, and the stabbing in Chalamish is, is, is raw, it's powerful. It's Shabbat dinner. There were five little kids in that house that the mother snuck upstairs and hid with and told them to be quiet while the stabbings and the screaming were happening downstairs. And, and that was the story told on national television in Israel. So these are strategic attacks. So, Habib, what are you saying? The, the, what, is, what is this push, then? What is this motivation going towards? What is your theory? Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's one of the most important um, things to understand about terrorism is that it is, it is ideological and it is planned. Most terrorists are middle class and educated. This is not an act of desperation. There is uh, from the side of Hamas and from the side of 
part of Fatah, an Islamic jihad, uh, which is backed by Iran, and their Islamic State uh, factions, very small, fought against by all the other Palestinian factions, but nevertheless exist in all of these places. And they all have backing and support and, and, and infrastructure in Jordan, and they all have backing and support infrastructure in Lebanon and in Qatar and in other places. And it looks like there's this very strong push, and it's happening now, and it might be happening from multiple directions, to force conflict to force, you know, a detachment of Israel from the Sunni Arab world, even as they grow closer, to, to respond to the fact that it looks like Israel has beaten back the third intifada, as they called it, or the stabbing intifada, by sparking something newer and bigger and stronger, to, to create more conflict with strategic attacks. In other words, don't be surprised if there's a fourth one a week from now. Well, Chaviv, I, I hope that... Uh Somehow this, uh, certainly the Jordan crisis is resolved soon and, uh, and that there can be calm uh, returned or relative calm return to the situation. But I truly, uh, we, we, we appreciate your input and uh, your assessment of the situation right now. And I hope to speak with you again soon and uh, hopefully with some better news. Thank you so much right. for joining us, though. About high tech or something fun. <laughs> I hope Th so. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Chaviv, and thank you for your uh, very hard work at the Times of Israel. Mm -hmm. We appreciate it. Chaviv Retigor is senior analyst for the Times of Israel, and uh, we thank him for his time and his perspective today on JBS. Thank you to our director, Sloan Copeland, production coordinator, Serge Goldberg, JBS associate director, Dara Golub, and to our editor, John McDevitt. I'm Tisha Bader, in for Mark Golub on this edition of In the News. Thank you.